So when we say the word prodigal, we immediately think about Bible stuff. We think about something that's somewhere in the Bible. A story about a lost son. But we have to uh, see a different perspective of this message. And it was a son that uh, actually ended up part of his journey living above the pig. So he was in a pig pen and he was uh, just feeding with the same food that was given to the pig. He came from a situation of wealth into a situation of poverty. However, many times we use this story and this parable uh, in order to talk about salvation, about our relationship with God, about many other things. But I would like to give you the right perspective of what Jesus was talking about when in Luke 15 he said in verse 11 there was a man who had two sons and the younger of them said to his father father give me the share of the property that is coming to me and he divided his property between them not many days later the younger son gathered all he had and took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in prodigal living or in reckless living. So this is the word prodigal. We see that this parable is talking about two sons that live under the same roof. And it's an illustration of the relationship between God and his children. So in this sense, the parable is not talking about a person that is just away from God and the committing sins, but it's talking about people, and if you will, be Christian people, if we apply to today's uh, reality, it's Christians like you and me. Christians just like you and me. It's talking about sons. It's not talking about people outside of the family. So Jesus Christ is really giving this illustration so that we will understand that there is a risk in our spiritual life and the risk that we have is to go astray and away from the Father's house. In this sense, church is not just a building. Church is more than a building. Church is the group or the family of God gathered. And this family gathers around the world and it happens together here in Greenfield Park, Long Island, Quebec, uh, under the name South Shore Community Church. But we're part of the, the God, and God's family in the whole, in general. So it's not talking specifically about one church, but it talks about our relationship with God. And I've seen through the years, uh, I, I'm uh, almost getting to 20, my 25th anniversary as a pastor full time, uh, and I've seen many people that come to church, they start to have a changed life, God starts to bless them. See, I, I've seen people receiving tremendous miracles of healing, healing of cancer, healing of, of incurable diseases, miracles in their, in their marriage, all sorts of miracles. But after a while, they get used to church. They get used to uh, their relationship with God becomes boring. And so it gets to a point in which they say, I want to have some fun. I want to have some fun. And in their relationship, they will go away from the, the father's house and they will try their living outside of the family of God. This is what the parable is talking about, about uh, reckless living. Now, prodigal, I went to the dictionary to, to find the, the right meaning, and the Bible dictionary gives us this uh, meaning. Dissolutely. Dissolutely. Well, to be the same. Dissolutely. I don't use this, this word. Do you use it in your everyday language? Dissolutely? Well, but it means riotous. Dissolute is used to describe a person lacking restraint. Okay, now I start to understand what, what this means. Lacking restraint. This is the, the correct interpretation of this. Uh, word and uh, on the English dictionary it says lacking moral restraint, indulging in sensual pleasures or vices. So the second definition is the one not on the Bible dictionary but the regular English dictionary. So a prodigal 
is a person that lacks restraint. Now, uh, all of us went through this process of lacking of restraint. If not, let me give you just some uh, examples. Now, but so we understand that, that Jesus is talking this parable to his children. Let me go to the beginning of the verse in uh, the chapter in Luke 15 and read the first two verses. It says, Now the tax collectors and sinners were all dry, drawing near to him, to whom? To Jesus. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So this is why Jesus was telling the parable. This, uh, he told different parables, and among these three different parables of the, of the lost coin, the lost sheep, the lost son, uh, he, he mentions these two sons. And it all starts because people were criticizing Jesus. You know that people criticize Jesus? You know that people criticize those that follow Jesus? You know that people sometimes don't understand that God loves us so much that He sent His only Son, Jesus, to teach us these principles to die on the cross for us so we can be saved from eternal separation from God. So Jesus is trying to explain to these religious people what happens to a person that has no restraint. And we all go through situations of lack of restraint. It can last for a couple of minutes, it can last for hours, it can last for years. There's people, the Christian, they love the Lord, then they go in the cruise, they fly to Miami, they get on the boat, and in the boat they see everybody having fun, and then they see uh, that they have free drinking. They have a pass, they can drink all those fancy cocktails and all those things, and they say, well, this is just four days. Let me just enjoy life and drink some uh, pina coladas with extra shots. And, uh, and so nobody knows. And so they lack restraint for those days. You see, sometimes people lack restraint and it's your day to stay at home and you don't know what to do. And you start browsing the internet. And as you browse the internet, you go to a website that you shouldn't, shouldn't be uh, uh, by any means. You know what I mean? And you like that restraint maybe for five minutes, ten minutes. But you've lost it. It's lack of restraint. Lack of restraint is when we cannot control our life in the sense that we do something that we know it's against God's rules. It's against the way we should be living in the Father's house. And I'm not talking just about these more serious situations. Or a, a person that promised the Lord that he will not take drugs anymore. Or he will not smoke anymore. He will not drink. There's a promise. But then there's lack of restraint. And you met this friend. And you smoke a joint. Or you do something else. And because of your lack of restraint, you go out of the Father's house. And you start living away from the, the protection and from the blessing you should be living in your everyday life. Now it's not that God is going to punish you. God is not that terrible God that is waiting for you to, to commit a sin or to do something bad and to, He wants to hit you with a 2 by 4 in your hand. No, this is not our God. God loves you. But if you want to go in your own way, He will let you go. He will let you. And as you go in your own way, eventually, Everyone, will, every prodigal, will end up in the pig pen. Everyone. And a pig is an illustration of something that's unholy. That's not pure. And if you die in the foreign land, you'll be eternally separated from God. But God made provision for all of you that went through a season of lack of restraint. To all of us that sometimes fail that sometimes do things that we shouldn't. We, we say words that we, we repent from those words. We, we have attitudes that we repent. And uh, I want to explain the reason why Christians become prodigals. And the reason is very simple. You now, when God created us, He created us in His image. And God is three, three in one. He's Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. 
And we can see this clearly through Scripture. And when He created us, He created us also as three in one. We are one individual, but we have spirit, soul, and body. So, uh, as we understand that we are spirit, soul, and body, right in the beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 2, we have this uh, very uh, summarized, uh, explaining this verse. It says in Genesis 2, 7, Then the Lord God formed the man of dust from the ground. Formed what? The man. This is the body. He formed him. And breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. So God gave them spirit. And the man became a living creature. So we, we have a, a body, we have our spirit, and we have our soul. Now the word soul in the New Testament is the word psyche. And, and we all have a psyche. There's a science that studies the mind, psychology. It's the study of the soul. Where's the separation between our soul and our spirit? That's really hard to tell. Only the Word of God can do this separation. We cannot do it by study. We cannot say where the soul ends and the spirit starts. But we have these three components in us. Now when God created man, God is spirit. God is spirit. And He intended for us to have fellowship with Him in the spirit. You know, the only way you can communicate with God is in the spirit. I know that some people uh, trust that a certain prayer done in a certain way or in a certain place will grant them access to God. But that, that's not the reality. God is spirit. And you can only find Him when you seek Him in spirit and in truth. It's not with the seed. It's not by our, for our own purposes. In order to seek God, you need to do it in the spirit. So we have spirit, and, and the Holy Spirit is, is, is that person of God with whom we can have fellowship and communicate. The Holy Spirit is on earth. God is everywhere, but we know that He's in a place we call heaven, in another realm. It's not the realm of our three dimensions. It, it's not up or down. It's a place called heaven. God is there, but the Holy Spirit of God was given to us, the church, so we can feel the presence of God and we have this assurance that when we pray and when we're in the right spirit, God will always listen and God will always answer. Amen. How do we become prodigals? It's when we go from the realm of the spirit to the realm of the flesh. And this word flesh, uh, it's, it's uh, repeatedly mentioned in the New Testament refers to the realm which is not of the spirit, to our soul and our body, the natural and physical world. World. So God intended us for us to have fellowship with Him in the spirit, intended for us to have fellowship with one another in the realm of the soul or our mind, and God intended us for us to relate to His creation also through our bodies. That's why, you know, we climb a mountain and we enjoy being at the top of the mountain. And we feel satisfaction. Or we, we're close to the ocean and we're watching the waves and we swim and, and we enjoy creation and we're glad and we say, oh, thank God for this wonderful creation. And we have these moments in which we can even perceive that God exists through our bodies. God created us this way. So we can perceive through our bodies. Sometimes we're uh, in a place where the presence of God is being manifested and we feel it in our bodies. We feel like goosebumps or we feel like something different. Or, or if, we, uh, if we don't uh, try to control the environment, we can even feel so much joy we start laughing just with the presence of God. And we feel something physical. So God will interact with us in different ways, through the different realms. The spirit, the soul, and the body. However, Christians become prodigal sons when they stop communicating with God in the spirit and they start to have a spiritual life which is alive and becomes a, a, a soulish experience, something in the realm of the flesh, of the soul, of the physical experiences. Our soul is where we have thoughts, feelings, it's where we make decisions. This is the realm of the soul. So I've decided how am I going to dress today. I've decided uh, how am I going to drink my coffee today. I've decided 
numerous things. This is my soul. This is my soul. It's your soul. You make your decisions. You see, some people, they start coming to church and they start dating. And they're dating someone that doesn't believe in God. And they know from the Word of God that God says, you should choose someone that communicates also with me in the Spirit. Otherwise, it's an unequal yoke. And so the people say, well, maybe one day this person will find the love of God and will find that they will need to have a relationship with God. And they make a soulish decision, decision of getting married without consulting God or disobey directly to the plan of God with their lives. And then we have the situation we have in the world today in which 80% of marriages end up in divorce. And people are still questioning why. And the reason why is very simple. It's because it was a decision in the level of the soul. Or in the level of the body. There was an attraction. Oh, she's so beautiful. Oh, he's awesome. Oh, look at, look at him. He's a beautiful man, handsome man. Wow. And so in the level of the body and the soul, there was a choice. But God was never consulted. And you see, in order for marriage to sustain, we need to have a connection in the spirit. Being soulmates, it's not enough. Because the soul can deceive you. But in the spirit, you will never be deceived. Amen. So it's very important for us to understand as Christians. If we start to do things in the level of the soul, our spiritual life becomes damaged. And you can come to church, any church, this church, other church. You read the Bible, but you don't feel God. You don't feel the anointing of God. But you keep going because you, you know it's what you should do. You've learned the rule. You've learned from Scripture that it's better one day in God's house than a thousand elsewhere. And you memorize this and you try to apply this in the level of the soul. But if your spiritual life is damaged, if your connection with God in the spirit is unexistent, you already became a prodigal. And there will be lack of restraint. <coughs> lack of restraint. You know, uh, in, in this world, we have many things happening through our life. Like that. And we have many decisions to make. Some we made them praying, and some we made them by gut feeling. Gut feeling is not the way to do things in the Father's house. In the Father's house, you can always go to the Father. You can always ask Him what to do. You can always go to Him and say, God, I want to have fellowship with you. Just embrace me. Just touch me. You see, we can talk a lot about God's love. And we have knowledge about God's love. But you will never feel God's love unless you connect with God in the Spirit. When Christians start to make their own decisions, being led by their thoughts, they lose mind at God's intention. And again, God's intention is very simple. He wants to have fellowship with us. God intended for you to relate to Him in the Spirit. And so in the Spirit we can praise Him. We can see who He really is. And we realize how awesome He is. It's not a matter of having a religion. But having a relationship with God. And through Christ, through Jesus Christ, we have access to the Lord. We have access to God in the Spirit. The world cannot understand this. The natural man, the one that is led by the flesh, the one that is led by the soul, cannot understand God. They try to figure out God. And they have questions. And there's even very smart people with really high IQ levels that will say God doesn't exist. God doesn't exist. They say the smartest man with the highest IQ uh, you know, it's a, it's a man in a wheelchair. I don't, I don't even want to mention his name, but he's considered the smartest man alive. He's on a wheelchair. He barely is able to speak. He's so smart. But he cannot figure out God. You see, you can be the smartest person on earth, but you cannot figure out God if you don't connect with Him in the level of the Spirit. Okay, so this is God's intention. Let me read just uh, uh, something from the Bible. Let me tell you, the Bible has only one author. <laughs> See, this, this is something we learn in the ISOM in the, in, the, in the school. 
We, we learned, we learned that, you know, at night we have our Bible school, and this is a tricky question. And if you're an ISOM student, you might have this question in your test. So pay attention. And the question is, how many, how many authors has the Bible? One. Now you know the answer. But you could be inclined to say there's 39, there's Jeremiah, there's uh, Isaiah, you know, there's Samuel, there's David, there's Moses, there's all of these writers. But they're the writers, they're not the authors. Now God gave us the Bible. He's the author. And through the Bible, we have the secret how to communicate with Him. Now, how can I, if I'm a prodigal, if I lack restraint, how can I return to the Father's arms? Because we didn't read the rest of the parable, but I guess you know. You know, he went astray, he spent all his money, he was broke, bankrupt, he has no house, he's trusting just that, that he can get some food out of the, out of, out of the, the, the pigs. So, he's not even eating the pig, he's eating the, you know, all that, that garbage food. He's a scavenger now. But he decides to go back to the father's house. And, and, and this is where the story shows that the father is waiting for him. And he embraces him. And he says, let's celebrate. Let's have a party. Dress him. He gave him his ring. He gives, again, he gives approval. And he said, now you were lost, but now you're found. And Jesus is explaining this principle to religious people, to the Pharisees, to, to those people that think that they can have a relationship with God because of what they do, because of the way they wash themselves, the way they dress, the way they speak. And we have so many people in our world today with the same kind of lifestyle. They carry their Bibles, they know their Bibles, but they don't know the author of the Bible. You see, you can know everything about scripture and theology and all these things. But if you don't know the author of the Bible, you don't, you've missed it all. You will be confused. You will lack restraint. Because when we have fellowship with the Lord, when those temptations come, you already did the prayer, lead me not into temptation. Why do we have to do this prayer? If we walk in God, because God knows that in this world, we have so many choices. And your spirit needs to be in charge of your life. We have a fight. There's a battle between the spirit and the soul. And there's hundreds of verses in the Old Testament. And in the New Testament, there's dozens that show this battle. One of them, it's in Galatians 5.17. That says, the sinful nature wants to do evil. Which is just the opposite of what the spirit wants. And the spirit gives us desires that are the opposite of what the sinful nature, nature desires. These two forces are constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. So listen, it's nothing abnormal that sometimes you do things that you don't want to do. Because we have these two natures. We have the spiritual person, the spiritual man or woman. The Bible refers to man as mankind. So you have the new man, the spiritual man, and you have the old sinful creature which is your flesh, your desires, your intentions. And they're always battling. There's a constant battle, the Bible says. And so, the, your nature wants to do the opposite of what God wants. And guess what? This happens to Christians, to the best of Christians. Those that, that say, oh, I walked with the Lord for 40 years. I've been in this church for 60 years. I've been in this church for 50 years. You know, I, 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 I'm a Christian. But guess what? Being a Christian doesn't put you out of the fight. In fact, it puts you right in the center of this fight, this struggle, this battle. And the choice is yours. Are you going to go in the direction of becoming a prodigal? Or are you going to judge things by the Spirit? You see, what's really important is to know what, what does God want. This is really important. You know, I've seen churches literally closing their doors. And every day in North America, there's churches closing. In fact, there's 3,000 churches that close every year in North America. They just close their doors. Why is that so? It's because they've lost purpose. They've lost their, their, their spiritual life. 
and they started to do things in the flesh. They started to say things like, oh, we've been doing this kind of things for 20 years now and we're going to continue to do it the same way. They will say things like, uh, we don't like this modern way of worship, worshiping God, you know, this Jesus culture and uh, hill songs and these things. We don't like it. We like better, you know, as we used to do when we were kids. And this is the reason why so many churches close. It's because they lost connection with God and God is Spirit. And in order to have fellowship with Him in the Spirit, we need to deny our flesh. Let me go to this just in a minute. Now, the second thing we need to do in order to come to the Father's house, we need to strive to reach spiritual maturity. Spiritual maturity, it's not something you reach just by coming to church. In Hebrews chapter 5 verse 12, it says, For though by this time you ought to be teachers, this was, what time? About two years of being in a church environment. You ought to be teachers. You need someone to teach you again the basic principles of the oracles of God. You need milk, not salty food. So he's, here is the, the author of Hebrews talking directly to the church. And he's saying, you should be all teachers. But you, guess what? You've lost it along the journey. So we need to go back to the basic principles of the Word of God. And verse 13 says, For everyone who lives on milk is unskilled in the word of righteousness, righteousness since he is a child. What is milk? Listen, we, we teach milk of the word here every Sunday. Why? Because we realize that in our church we have young Christians that need milk. We have a little bit mature Christians that, that need cereal. And we have uh, young Christians that need steak and eggs. And we have mature Christians that need, you know, something stronger. So we try and we preach a message to touch all of these different realms and levels of relationship with God. I found out as a pastor that the messages in our church that get better response are the milk of the word. Like a message on God's love. I've realized, Pastor Jordan or myself or anyone preaches a message on God's love and at the end everybody, whoa, wow, what a message. Milk. <clears throat> Milk. If we try to look for something more complicated, like today, for instance, uh, you know, I, I like better, you know, a message on God's love. I don't want to offend anyone. Let me tell you this. By this time, you should all be teachers. Amen. <laughs> it's not my word. It's the word of God. Amen. Then he said, 14, but the solid food is for the mature, for those who have, listen to this, their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. You know, we missed it. The, the point is not if you drink milk or if you eat solid food. The point is not if you just satisfy with a message of salvation or a deeper teaching in the Word of God. This is not the point. The point is when to reach maturity, it's not by what you listen, but you need to discipline yourself to do what? By constant practice. Constant practice. Tell the person next to you, constant practice. Constant practice. You know how Nash plays the guitar here? And he's getting better and better. And he's singing and he's singing better and better. Amen. You know how? Because he has constant practice. If he, if he just does praise and worship once a year, he'll be nervous, not knowing what to do. And when he, we're praising the Lord from here, sometimes everybody is distracted. We feel a heaviness in the church and we want to praise the Lord and it seems that the praise is not going through. But because there's constant practice, we say, I don't care if there's people that are distracting, I'm going to praise the Lord. Amen. And with constant practice, a skilled worship leader can worship anywhere, can worship in the Arctic of the Spirit, where everybody's frozen. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? Why do I pray constantly? You know, I, I'm not afraid of the devil, I'm not afraid of curses, 
I'm not afraid of, of those things. Why? Because I have constant practice of prayer. I pray every day. I put God first in everything. So in order to serve God, it's not a matter of skill, because there's skill, skill, people with skills that preach really nice messages, but they're still satisfied with the milk of the word, of the word. We need to practice how to distinguish good from evil. And you might know, I know what's good, I know what's evil. Do you? It requires constant practice. So we need to grow to maturity. And finally, we need to kill our flesh or our selfish desires. If you want to return to the Father's house, if you want to return to that level of relationship, and let me tell you, there's the many Christians, I'm telling you, in all the churches, listening to these messages, people that came to a point where they say, I don't want to go to church, it's boring, it's always the same. I don't want to get involved into church politics. I don't want to get involved into this. I don't want to, you know, I, I worship at home. I don't want to get into fights. I don't want to get into this. And they, they went through the way of the prodigal. The father still loves them. But if you don't return to the father's house, you might be lost. You might not find your way back. You might get into a point in which the world will just choke you. And you will not have a, a, a fresh relationship with God. Hebrews 4, this is the most important part of this message. So bear with me. Verse 12. For the Word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, of joints and of marrow, and discerning the thoughts and intentions of the heart. This is the verse we usually read when we're doing the Bible study. It's a beautiful verse, right? It says that the Word of God can bring the vision or separation between the things of the flesh and the things of the spirit. Right? Yes. We understand, do, do, do you understand this? So if you don't read the Word of God every day, if you don't fill your heart with the Word of God, if you don't have a devotional time, a time alone with God, it's not enough to listen to a preacher. We need to listen to God Himself in a personal and regular basis. Every day, in a daily basis, we should spend time reading Scripture, reading the Word of God, allowing God to talk to us. And before you read the Word of God, it's not just a matter of discipline, but you say, God, talk to me. Talk to me through your Word. And you spend some time. And you, you might have a plan, or you might just, you know, decide what, what book you're going to read. But when you ask God to talk to you, He will always will through His Word. But let me get you to the most important verse that I want to mention this morning, which is verse 13, Hebrews 4, 13. And, and the Bible says, And no creature is hidden from his sight, but all are naked and exposed to the eyes of him whom we must give account. Amen. So let me tell you this. You can hide yourself. You can put a mantle of righteousness in the eyes of people. You can do long prayers and you seem to be very spiritual. And everybody thinks, oh, what a woman of God. Oh, what a man of God. And you can put this cover up like the Pharisees, like the Sadducees, like those that are questioning Jesus, like those that are saying, this man cannot be holy because he sits and eats with unholy people, with sinners, with people that have no place in our gatherings in our religious gatherings. And Jesus is telling them the parable of the prodigal, saying that doesn't matter who you are, you can start well, but finish in the wrong port. You can finish in the wrong destination. You can finish in the, in the wrong, completely wrong place. I remember once I, I was going home, wasn't here in Montreal, and I was so tired, then I fell asleep on the subway. And I passed the station. And then I woke up. And I was at the end of the line. I said, oh God. So I got out of the train, entered the train in the opposite direction. And I fell asleep again. <laughs> Seriously. And this happened to me three times. I hope it doesn't happen to you. It's horrible. When we miss the mark, we lose time, we waste time. And in your speech, 
your life, you might be wasting time if you still come to church, but you have a relationship with God that is based in knowledge. We need to go back to the basic principles in order to grow to maturity. We need to return to the Father's house. See, I was talking with this, with this person and, uh, and he was telling me, I am a pastor. Okay, that's good. So where's your church? And he told, well, right now I don't have a church. And I told him, so you're not a pastor. <laughs> what do you mean? You're, I'm not a pastor. Yes, I was ordained as a pastor. Listen, you have the title of pastor, but you're not a pastor. Can you understand this? You're not. You can have the title of Christian, but you're not a Christian anymore. When do you stop being a Christian? When instead of having life in the Spirit, you decide to do things the way you think it's better. The reason why we have pastors in church, it's, it's, it's to help your spiritual life to grow up to maturity. So sometimes, Pastors will tell things that people don't like to hear. And you know what a, a, a Christian in the flesh does? Does like the turtle. Gets inside the shell and hides there. Some will do like the, like the big bird, the ostrich. They will dig their, their head in the sand. Not knowing they have a huge target there. You know? That's why we have people. God gives the fivefold ministry so we all grow to maturity. Let me finish this message. Ephesians 4, 24 my last scripture for, for this morning. It says that we put off concerning the former conversation of the old man. The old man. Ladies, you all have an old man. Because when the Bible tells old man, it's old man and old, old woman. It's the old nature. Okay? So... We put on concern the former what? Conversation. What's a conversation? It's the way we communicate. It's our words. The words of the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lusts. And be renewed in the spirit of your mind. And that we put on the new man, which, is, which after God is created in righteous and true holiness. So we need to put, put off the old man and put on the new man. How many of you ladies like shopping for new clothes? <laughs> One, two. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so you shop for new, and guys like it too. You shop for new, and eventually the old stuff gets there in the closet and it's still there and because it was expensive or had some sentimental thing you still keep the old stuff in the closet some of you that used to have your wedding dress which is 40 years old and it's there in that box with moth balls and everything and you try to put it one day and you realize the dress shrinks <laughs> or something else Maybe it wasn't the dress, maybe it's something to do with your body. <laughs> but we keep those old, old clothes. And it gets to a point, maybe they're still good, and, but we don't use <coughs> them anymore. So I give them to Cher. <laughs> or I give them to the Salvation Army. Right? So, but there's a season in which we still keep the old stuff in the closet, and some they keep it for a long time. And let me tell you, the older you get, the longer you keep your old rags. Hello. Yeah. <laughs> Till the point that you're completely out of fashion. And people will look at you and they say, wow, mom, I think that dress is from the 60s. <laughs> Were you a hippie or something? <laughs> and, and it's like this because we still keep the old stuff in the closet. Once in a while, it's, it's good practice to go through your closet and check what you don't use anymore and get rid of it. 
in the spirit. In the spirit. Here's what we need to do. There's things you've learned 20 years ago. You still keep them in the closet of your mind. Some are really good. You keep them. But there's new things that God wants to do in your life. There's new wine. And you might say the old wine is better. But God says, I have another idea. I think the new one is better for you. Hello. So, this is my message for today. Let me tell you. Your God died for your sins. It's not you. It's not the church. God died for your sins. Then you have choices. You can choose to live in the Father's house. And when you're in the Father's house, you submit to the authority of the Father. <coughs> you submit to God. You submit to the will of God. You submit to, to those also that God placed in position to keep an eye on you. To be able to tell you, listen, come back to God. That attitude, you should change. Don't allow your sinful nature to take control of your spiritual life. To encourage you. To tell you, you'll do something for the Lord. How can you say you love the Lord? Jesus said, you'll be my friends if you obey what I tell you. How can you have a relationship in the Spirit if you decide the God you want? If you decide, well, I believe in God, but I believe in my own way. I believe in God, but, you know, I have my own image of who God is. God is spirit. If you seek Him in spirit, you'll get to know Him. And this morning I finish by telling you, make the right choice. Put sin away. Decide to have a relationship with God. Maybe you're in church and you didn't realize, but by this, by this time you're a prodigal. You see, the spirit of religion blinded the Pharisees and the Sadducees. And they, they should worship Jesus Christ. But he came to his own and his own didn't recognize him. If that happened in the past, I'm telling you, it can happen today. God can pass by right now. And he's right here in this church. And he's knocking. He's knocking in your heart. And He's just telling, will you let me in? God is just telling you, stop doing things your own way. Come back. Come back to me. Come back to the Father's house. I'd like to invite you all to stand and the worship team to come.